you're just going to need a Bible in front of you. Uh, if you don't have a, like a paper Bible, then um, you can go to a, a, a BibleGateway.com on your iPhone and feel free to take that out and put it on Vibrate and then you can follow along with the message today. Hey, um, we, Brandon mentioned just how God's moving and I, I just, as we were praying before church this morning, I just felt like Marty and I, it's like, man, we can just spend all day just thanking God for all that he's done. And so I just hope that you, even in your darkest hour, if you have Jesus Christ, you have reason to praise this morning. Even if you came this morning discouraged and down or fearful of the things going on in this world, this is a place um, where you can meet God and know that God loves you and uh, he's going to give you strength to make it through even the most difficult times. So we have felt... We're, we're, we started a series called Sent out of the Gospel of John, and we're realizing what it means that God sent his son, Jesus Christ. Love sends. God sent his son in the flesh, right? The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, glory of the one and only sent from God, full of grace and truth. That's John chapter 1. John chapter 3, we saw this, uh, this just most popular, powerful text that's ever given. That God loved the world. God so loved you. God loved you so much. He sent his one and only son into this world uh, to go to a cross and pay a price for you. Whoever believes that you, you don't have to die. You don't have to be separated from God. Whoever believes can have eternal life. And, and God did not send. He did not send. His son into the world to condemn the world. He doesn't want to condemn you. He wants to save you. That's why Jesus came. And not only did Jesus come for his own people, the Jews, he came and gave his life and was sent to everyone. We, have, we as a church have felt sent this year to places even globally <laughs> feeling called by God to go with, with the good news. And so I wanted just to share a couple of the things that God has been doing. And so Brendan talked about them. Uh, Connor, I think we got a few slides. Maybe you could just uh, thumb through some of this. Now, this thing is just for me. This was uh, some of the ladies that went to our senior housing project, which is <coughs> probably just maybe 300 steps this way. And I think they, they, they prepared for 30, and there are like 50 people showed up. Uh, from, of these seniors that, you know, many of them who've lost their loved ones. And so we just felt called to go there and love on them. So so thank you for all who helped throw um, this Valentine's party. I, I think somehow God multiplied the fishes and loaves because they prepared for 30 and there were 50. So that's great. A couple more. Then just look, look at some of these adorable smiles. These people that just are so thankful that, that we would come and have a Valentine's party with them. And then uh, maybe, now this here, <laughs> you can't quite see Caitlin's face, but it's pretty funny. Um, and there's Braxton as well. Go, go ahead, show another slide there. And there's Katie. With the, this is uh, the Valentine's party. We, we threw a Valentine's party where the parents could go out from the daycare. They could just go out uh, and from the church. And we just loved on the kids. And they had, oh, look at these precious children. And there's Juniper having a good time, and so uh, I'm just a wonderful girl there. I got to know her, and Claire, I think was her name, and just so, so sweet. So God's using us, um, and, and God is sending us with the love and gospel of Jesus. So open your Bibles, turn to John chapter 4. John is in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I'll break this text down into uh, kind of multiple layers. There are so many things. This is just a, a chapter of the Bible you've got to go back and read through. We can't cover everything. And you might be, I hope you're actually sitting there thinking, John, why didn't you talk about this or that? Because we just, we'd be here all day. And, uh, but I'm going to point out a few things. So Jesus, what you're going to see in John chapter 4 is Jesus came to give his life. So that those who are outsiders could become insiders with God. Outsiders becoming insiders. That you'll see the Samaritans 
or outsiders. So John chapter 4, I'm going to begin in verse 4. Now he had to go through Samaria, talking about Jesus. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone to the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst again. Indeed, the water that I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water. So I won't get thirsty. I have to keep coming back to this well and draw water. And he told her, Go call your husband. Come back. I have no husband, she said. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have five husbands. And the man that you're with now, that you now have, is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. Sir. Sir, the woman said. I can see you are a prophet. Our ancestors worship on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman. Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and now has come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he's going to explain everything to us. Jesus said, Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. I am he. Wow, that is rich. Have you ever felt like an outsider? I, I think back, you know, over my life, and there's actually many times I felt like an outsider. Like I just didn't quite fit in. Like I just didn't belong. It, it seemed like with all these different groups in junior high and high school, you know, I was trying to fit in. And, you know, whether it's the way that I dressed to try to fit in or the way that I talked, I try to fit in. The, you know, I, like, I think I wore bell-bottom jeans to try to fit in, um, had long curly hair, right? all these things, right? And, and so you can think in school, and you can think in these social networks, you can think in political networks, you want to fit in. You know, if you want to have the right shoes, you want to have the, the name brand of clothes so that you fit in with the cool crowd. And then I went through life, right? And, and as I got older, again, I'm just trying to fit in, but, but I'm also realizing, you know, I want to I wanna be Christ to this world, not, not like be Jesus, but I want to let my light shine, and, and you know, Christianity in our world today is a little different. It's not the end thing to do to be a Christian, so it's, times have just changed, and, and then, you know, both my kids somehow, miraculously, not from Becky and I, were math geniuses, and they are just math geniuses, and Zachary would come home from college and he'd, he'd sit around with, like, his math professors would come to our house and 
you know, they talk and play games, and then they start to tell math jokes, right? <laughs> and like, they they say something, you know, in, in math language, and ha ha ha, you know, and I go ha ha ha, didn't have a clue <laughs> what they were talking about. Um, so, all right, I had to throw one in here. Why did the math plant have problems growing? Because it had a square root. <laughs> they thought that was so funny. You know, just like, what? what? I don't even know what a square root is, right? Yeah. So, again, I think all these times we try to belong. And here's the thing about this Samaritan woman. She didn't belong. She didn't belong to the inside religious group. She didn't belong to the chosen people, the Jews. And she actually felt like she belonged to her own group, which had different beliefs than the Jews. So I want us to just briefly go back through this text and let me point out a, a few things to you. So, so look again at verse 4. It said Jesus had to go through Samaria. Jesus didn't have to go through Samaria. In fact, most Jews would have avoided Samaria. The, the Jewish people would travel like an extra, you know, miles, half day, just to go around Samaria because the Samaritans were outsiders. The Samaritans, just, you know, real, real brief history, were they, they were like half-breeds. They were half-Jews, and then they had married, intermarried with the Assyrians. I think like 742 B.C., Assyria came in and invaded, and, and they, they left some of the Jews there, but then they took Jews back, and, and many of these Jews had settled in Samaria, and so they had intermarried, and so they're half-Jews and then half-Gentiles. And so they were just hated. I mean, the Jewish thought, you know, we're the true people of God. You, you guys are, you know, you're these half-breeds. So Jesus didn't have to go through Samaria. It says he had to go through Samaria, but like any good Jew, he could have gone around Samaria because the Samaritans were unclean. You go, you step foot through the town of Samaria as a Jew, you're going to be unclean in a hurry. You go to a well, and you drink water, it is unclean water. If you were to touch the jug that this woman brought, when Jesus asked her for, if you were even to touch the jug or, or a cup that this Samaritan woman had touched, you would, have been, you would have been unclean and you would have had to go through ceremonial washing to become clean again. Jesus is shattering all types of boundaries when he goes through Samaria. They hated that unclean, half-breed people. And they really didn't have religion right either, at least to the Jews. In fact, they had their own uh, first five books of the Bible, the, the Septuagint. They had their own Septuagint and their own translation and their own way of doing things. And thus you see kind of this little religious discussion come up with this woman and with Jesus. Jesus had to go through Samaria because he wasn't sent only to a few people. Jesus was sent to all people. Jesus was sent to this world as a baby and went to a cross and died for you. We are, most of us here, some have been born Jewish, but most of us are not born Jewish. And, and so this is powerful because this is Jesus saying, look, I came for everyone, Jews and the Gentiles. Now, let me just point out, this is key, the boundaries that Jesus breaks throughout this text. First of all, going to Samaria was breaking a boundary for a Jew. You don't go there. It would have been like us hopping on a plane and flying to China today with the coronavirus. That's, what it, I mean, that's how bad they would have looked at it. I mean, let's, let's just go to China, and they've got viruses, and maybe we would get sick. And so who would want to do that? But Jesus does that. A Jew talking to a Samaritan was a radical boundary that was broken. To touch this water jar that came would have been broken. 
it's interesting that the text says that it is 12 o'clock in the day. Women, in the time of Jesus, went to the well for water in the morning, and they went to the well in the evening, and they always traveled together. For a woman to go to the well at 12 o'clock in the day alone was scandalous. She may not have only been looking for water. She might have been looking for another man. She knew a lot of men in this town. And Jesus knows that about her. That's why he just <laughs> straight to the chase. He talks about her scandalous past. Twelve in the afternoon, alone at a well, a woman being alone, Jesus, a man talking with a woman, boundary breaking. And this is, you've got to know the background just to read this to realize this is absolutely scandalous. And you don't, first you don't talk to a woman you don't know at a well at 12 o'clock. You certainly don't talk about theology. You don't talk about spirituality. Religion was a man's conversation. So to be talking about religious things with this woman, again, shattering boundaries. And evidently, some other people have broken that boundary too because she kind of knows what she's talking about. She lays out some good points, but, but if you don't talk religion, then you certainly wouldn't talk about her social past. So Jesus, listen, here's the point. Jesus is going to break absolutely every boundary that there is between you and God because he wants you to be forgiven. He wants, there's no boundary Jesus won't break. There's no sin in your life that is so deep that Jesus didn't die for that sin. His grace, his gift of grace is given to everyone. Social boundaries he broke, political boundaries he broke, ethnic boundaries he both broke, gender boundaries Jesus broke, reputation, Reputation boundaries Jesus broke. Jesus risked his reputation, which is exactly what he was doing, to bring this woman who then brings this town salvation. She brings salvation to the entire town, as we'll see in just a little bit, as she takes this message of Jesus. Five husbands, and the one you're with now is not your husband. And that, that, that's what we kind of saw with Nicodemus. I mean, he's like, sir, we see you're doing wonderful things, you know. He's like, unless you're born, water, and spirit, you can't make it into heaven. Just cuts to the chase of why that. He knows why she, she, what she needs, and he knows why she's there. So he says, you've had five husbands, and the one you're now with is not your husband. And so you kind of just see her kind of going through the map. Well, you know, there was him, and there was him, and... Him, how'd you know about him, right? I mean, it's like, well, I thought there were four. You're, you're saying five, you know. I don't know what's going through her head, but she's counting back. She's looking at her past, and she realized, oh, my gosh. God, God's speaking to this person. You must be a prophet of God. And, and she's talking about her shady past, or at least Jesus knows it. And then she talks about, she wants, now that she realizes he's a prophet, now she wants to talk about religion. Because she knows he's a spiritual man. And so she says, you know, true, true worshipers, you know, would, would worship in Jacob, worship, would worship in Jerusalem. She knows that there's challenges in Jerusalem. And she knows her people are at Jacob's well, and they're taking pride in Jacob's well. So, okay, spiritual person, spiritual man, is it going to be Jacob's well, or is it going to be Jerusalem? And Jesus says it's not going to be either. Or actually, it's going to be both. Right? True worshipers will worship in spirit, and in truth. And last week we saw that when you come to Jesus, you put your faith in Jesus, you are to be immersed in the Spirit. You are to be born again. You are to be born in the Spirit. Born in the flesh, born in the Spirit. And then we saw in Acts chapter 2, when you, when you trust in Jesus and you are baptized into Jesus Christ, as, as Kara's going to do at 2 o'clock today at Alicia's house, she's going to put Christ on in baptism. And everybody's invited to come to that. And, uh, but when you're, when you're baptized, Acts tells us your sins are washed away. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so he's saying, look, 
The time actually now has come because Jesus is here that true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. And usually people always kind of have a hold on one or the other. And you don't find a lot of people worshiping with both. What does it mean to worship in the spirit? It means to worship connected with the Holy Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit moves your heart and it touches you deeply. It touches your emotions and even your mind and your thinking, worship and spirit. But the mind bores truth, right? We have the truth. So you have some people that it's all about the truth. And are you doing it the right way? And so that's what she's saying. Is it in the right place? On the right box check, right? Jacob, Jerusalem, he said it doesn't matter. True worshipers are going to worship in spirit and in truth. And then he says this, give me, a, give me, give me some water. And, and she's like, well, you know, what are you going to draw with? What are you doing at the well? And, and you've got this amazing passage that he says, I'm going to give you water. You won't have to come to this well again. And she's like, what's he talking about? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness sake. I'm going to give you living water. And so to us this morning, that's what Jesus wants for your life. He wants you to have this living water that just wells up inside of you. And it quenches your thirst. What are you thirsty for right now? What are you just hungering for in your life? You know, what is it that you feel like just there's just part of you that's just not satisfied? And Jesus says, I'm going to give you water that is living water. And that's what we need. We need life. And Jesus offers us life through this living water so we don't have to go to the well. Isn't there just rich, rich passage? And then you keep reading John chapter 4, and there's so much more. So verse 27, look at what it says there. He's having this conversation with this woman. I want to point several things out here. Verse 27, just then his disciples returned and were surprised he was talking with a what? Woman. I would have thought he was surprised talking with a Samaritan, but Jesus... His disciples are shocked, again, that he's talking with a woman at the well at 12 o'clock. But they're so shocked by this because it breaks these, these gender boundaries that they don't even ask him. It says, verse 27, no one asked him, you know, what do you want? Why are you talking with her? But they're thinking this, and Jesus knows, of course, what they're thinking in their mind. And, and I think... Verse 28 is the most powerful part of this text. It says, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Could this be the one? That's what she's thinking. But those four words, just four words, leaving her water jar. She comes to the well for water. And she's so taken by Christ's love and truth and spirit that she rushes back to the town and she leaves her water jar by the well. Isn't that powerful? So here's, here's I think, how this applies to us. We come looking. We come looking for something. And you're in this life. What, what are you searching for, right? I still haven't found what I'm searching for. What is it you're longing for? What is it you're searching for? And Jesus gives you so much more. She goes away with so much more than what she came for. And, and that's what Jesus wants to bring into your life, even this morning, your faith in him. She goes back to the town, and, and now she's sharing her story. Come, see a man who told me everything I did. Again, social boundaries, gender boundaries. Can you remember a time, just think back over your life, when you came to Jesus for one thing and he gave you something completely different? Have you ever had that happen? You're like, Jesus, I, I need this. And your word says that if we pray to you, you will give us the desires of our heart. You'll give us... 
what we want if we just have faith and ask. So Jesus, I'm asking you in faith. I'm asking you in faith. Again and again and again. And it's not coming. It's not happening. Because he has something much better for you in mind. That's what happens with her. And that's what God wants to happen with you. That you come in searching of something. And Jesus has so much more in store. What he offers you. Could this be the Messiah? So powerful. But there's more. Look at verse 39. Many Samaritans believe. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of this woman's testimony. She all of a sudden has influence that women didn't necessarily have, or they had, but it was never recognized. Jesus values women way more than in their society. They looked down on women, but Jesus valued women. Jesus talked religion with this woman. Jesus empowers this woman with salvation. I just want you to know, even in our culture today, if, if, if you're a lady here, you need to know how much Jesus values you. He sees right into your heart and he loves you more than you can imagine. And if you feel disrespected, if you feel devalued, even in our culture today, it wasn't anything like in the time of Jesus. He loves you more than you can imagine. And so many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of this woman's testimony. She said, he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of his words now, many more became believers. Verse 42. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. And we know this man really is the savior of the world. Now that is powerful influence that she had. Tremendous influence. She knew the men of the town. She knew the men of the town. But knew them in a different way. And now they're listening to her. A woman's testimony. A woman shares the gospel. A woman has this powerful story. Jesus would never marginalize Samaritans, women, anyone. Jesus was sent to everyone. And many now believe. Several things I just want, want you to take away. First of all, we have a testimony. If you believe in Jesus Christ, if you our child of God, you have a very unique testimony. Everybody's testimony here is different. And it's because of the testimony of this woman that many people believe. What has Jesus done for you? How has Jesus impacted your life? How has Jesus uniquely changed you? And, and I don't care if you think it's this powerful testimony or a little testimony. God, just like this woman, is going to multiply the testimony. So we have a testimony. We have influence. Regardless of your race, the color of your skin, your socioeconomic background, whether you're a male or a female, where you live, you have influence because you have the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ within you. And not only do we have a testimony, not only do we have influence, we are called to take risks. Listen, you're called to risk something for your faith in Jesus Christ. He wants us to be bold. Would you, like Jesus, be willing to risk your reputation by loving someone different than yourself? Would you be willing to risk your reputation to love someone that's outside of your box and bring them the good news of Jesus? So I believe the story of the woman of the well compels us to answer the question, who is your Samaritan? Think about that just for a moment. Who's your Samaritan? Everybody needs a Samaritan. 
And every Samaritan in this world needs you. Jesus risked it all to forgive you and bring you salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And again, I just want to encourage you, if you've not made that decision to be a Jesus follower, to put your faith in Jesus, to be baptized into Jesus Christ, what's holding you back? Take a risk. He risked it all for you. Take a risk and step out in faith in Jesus and let the Holy Spirit transform your life into exactly who God created you to be. Let's pray and then we'll stand and sing. Father, thank you so much for every person that's here this morning, Father, and thank you that you came into our Samaria, Lord. You came to us, every person here, God, individually, you gave your life for them, Lord. Help us, Father, to trust you and believe you and put our faith in you, God. And help us, God, because you were sent to us to begin to imagine who is our Samaria, who are the people you're sending us to, to bring them the good news and light and love of Jesus Christ. Thank you for this morning. Continue to move in our hearts this day. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.